herd of snails. I want to talk about the wind. The wind. Genesis 8 and verse 1. <clears throat> and God remembered Noah and everything, every living thing, and all of the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. And uh, I just returned from a long trip, gone for several days, didn't get much sleep, and got back just in time to look over my notes real quick. So I'm not going to be embarrassed to just literally read if I have to. <clears throat> but I want to just um, go over something that I shared during the conference time, just to make sure that the point is there. <clears throat> and that is... The two-sided factor of the cross and of the spirit. And in the, the chart that we had of Noah, the, the uh, flood represents the cross. But here we have the wind helping to subside the flood, and it also helped direct where the ark would land. And then the ark landed and found rest. <clears throat> All right, I remember reading uh, different places in the scriptures that said, for ye are dead, or I am crucified with Christ. <clears throat> and my understanding of that was, anything that's not Jesus is flesh. That which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is spirit. And anything that is flesh is dead. And anything that is Christ is what lives. <clears throat> All right. So then when I would read in Galatians where it says the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit and these two are contrary to the one another and it says <clears throat> walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So my mind goes like this. Wait a minute. If the cross is real, if we died with Jesus... Why are we walking in the Spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh? Why aren't we reckoning on the cross? Can I get a, that's interesting. <laughs> I mean, you know, I remember years ago that thought coming to me and thinking, this, you know, this walking in the Spirit seems to be a thing that you do sort of down the road, actually once you've got some things settled. So if the flesh is dead, what has walking in the spirit got to do with not fulfilling the lust of the flesh? Just reckon the flesh dead and you're free. You know? And, and, did not the cross do the work? These are the kind of thoughts that come in my mind constantly when I'm reading scriptures, because I, you know, I, when I read something and it seems contrary or contradictory, I, you know, I gave up years ago thinking the Bible contradicts itself. Now I want to know the truth behind it because when it appears to contradict, I have had too many years where the Lord would show me later something. And I go, oh, oh, okay. You know, it looked like it was contradictory. But well, I think this is one of those situations. And that is that... In our chart on the board, we had the flood, we had the ark, and then we had the new creation. And this wind has, has dried the judgment up. The flood has dried, we just read that, is drying up the land. And, and uh, you know, if there's a big rain or even snow, if you have a wind come after that, it'll dry it up. It'll take the snow away and dry it out and, you know, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> So the wind was responding in two different ways. It was drying up the judgment, <clears throat> and the wind was guiding the ark to its resting place in the new creation. Okay? And how those two relate is that the cross or the judgment dealt with the flesh back over here at the flood. That's where the cross dealt. 
But for Noah, inside that ark, still in the cocoon, he, it's, it's only as valuable as you can walk in it. And that requires the Holy Spirit to reveal it. Is it true? Yes, it's true. Does it work automatically starting 2,000 years ago because the cross was true and finished? Does it work automatically in everyone's life? Well, apparently not. I'm, I'm guessing here. But uh, it doesn't appear to. Then what is the key? And the key is given over and over in different scriptures. Uh, for example, Ephesians 1.17, that the eyes of your understanding may be, and this is, this is the apostle speaking to the church, not to sinners that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that you may know him, that you may know all these things that it starts getting into, <clears throat> that he may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that's what the wind represents. It is, it is taking the ark from the judgment, drying up the judgment and making it no longer the issue, and bringing the ark into the new creation where you can walk in it. Does that make sense? About that, that would be the spirit part. The revelation part is simply revealing the depth of what took place at the flood. The flood does not become effectual for anybody in the ark until the Holy Spirit reveals it. It's just, it's either ignorance. I saw a sign the other day that said, ignorance is bliss until, the, until you die. <laughs> yeah. I thought, right on. <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> it, 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 we're either just ignorant of it, or we have a head knowledge of it. We have, uh, we have been taught by somebody. Now remember, Paul said, I was taught by the Spirit, the revelation of Christ. So you can't really teach the revelation of Christ. You can only teach about it. But only the Holy Spirit can reveal Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal what the flood accomplished. And only the Holy Spirit can guide you from the judgment of it into the new creation reality of it. Okay? So I'm just going to read a little bit of my notes here because that's the basic premise that I wanted to try to communicate. And I figured if I just said it. When judgment ceases, that's the cross. In other words, when the flood begins to stop. When, when, not when the flood's over, but when the rain stops. The judgment of it has stopped because when the rain stopped, I'm guessing everything was already dead. 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, anyway. So when judgment ceases or the rain stops, then God causes a wind, which is a type of the Holy Spirit. Remember he says in Genesis 1 that the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And caused the ark to begin to pass over the earth <clears throat> and the waters of judgment began to abate and the ark finds rest, verse 4, and the ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ar Ararat, Ararat, however you pronounce that. Now God, uses, now God uses the wind to deliver, not from the world, for the deliverance came from the cross, but, the, but delivered from the ark into the new creation. The wind is bringing you into the new creation and ultimately drying it up so that you can leave the ark and walk in it. And we'll get into that in just a minute with the door and the window. Um, the cross did the work. Amen? But we need the spirit to reveal it. Before the, wind, before the wind, though the ark was a secure habitation, it had much tossing and shifting with it. For example, you, the wind has not brought you to this place of rest in the new creation. So you're still 
as it were, passing through the judgment. There's jerking and hard to walk and hard to find stability yet, even though, you're st even though it's a secure habitation in the ark. Can I get amen? It's secure in there, but it's not stable in there. You know what I mean, you know. <clears throat> and so, I mean, you know, if like the hippos and the elephants all go on one side, you know, everything, you know. <clears throat> anyway. Um, so, and that's similar to Jesus when he was in the boat with the disciples. It says that as soon as they reached land, as soon as they reached solid ground, the wind ceased. When Jesus was, as was asleep in the boat and they woke him up and they got all, you know, and everything, well, the wind brought them over there. The Holy Spirit represented by the wind. So the ark comes to rest by the Spirit, and we find rest in his rest. The ark finds rest. We rest because there's no more shifting. You're now on the solid ground of the new creation. But you didn't find rest. The ark did. And your rest comes because he's found, he has come to rest in this new creation. And that's, you know, there's so much that could be said there. <clears throat> but let me just suffice it to say, as far as God is concerned, he's at rest over these things. We're the ones struggling and striving. And Anybody ever had a thing of striving over the truth in your life? You know, you know a few of us have, you know. <laughs> Particularly, it seems to be this side over here. But... <clears throat> But um, the ark rests on the ground of the old being removed and the establishment of the new. In other words, until the old creation is done away and everything is dead by the flood, and then the judgment has ceased, meaning the waters have abated, then there's rest because you've arrived at the new creation. Is that logical? <clears throat> um, so the settledness of what is yet unseen by those in the ark begins to have an effect on you, meaning there's this, un there's this lack of stability as long as the waters of judgment are still upon the earth. But once the ark finds rest, you find rest, you find stability. Because there's no more tossing and there's no more all this kind of stuff. The ark rests in the, in the reality of the new creation. We're at rest at that point in the ark that has found rest. Okay. Now this is important because the winds of the spirit is what's bringing you there, but the spirit starts moving way before you start walking in the new creation. Can I get an amen? I mean, that's, the, that's a fact. I mean, there's just, a, you know, he shows you all kind of stuff about the new creation, but you are far from walking in it and certainly far from being stable in it, any kind of stability. You can be shook again. You're, what was that? You know? Are we floating again? You know? <clears throat> so, um, let's see. So the subtleness of what is yet unseen, and I say unseen because they're in the ark and they cannot see the stability of where he has landed. They only sense a new stability in Christ, but not in the fullness of the new creation. In other words, for a lot of us, Jesus is pretty small. The new creation is, you know, deep and wide, you know, and the ark is like real small. And our Jesus, even our revelation Jesus, usually is pretty small. And we think that we've got it all because we've, you know, we, we've counted how many boards are in the ark because we were in there so long, you know, laying there at night, one, two, you know what I mean? And how many knots, you know, you can see and all this kind of stuff. And, and so we think we have a good understanding of what it means to be in Christ. No, no, no. That's just, that's just the, in the death and in the burial. And, and I want you to think about that for a minute. Much of the early learning that we learn of being in Christ is about the death and primarily the death, really. You know? And we're, you know, going, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. But the fullness of this new creation, we haven't eaten of it. We haven't even seen it. 
it's going to take a dub to even start showing us that stuff. All right. <clears throat> so, um, and I said, you're in the ark. You haven't fully seen the new creation, but your sense, you're coming to a sense of stability now. And that's important. You know, you're starting to feel a little more confident in, in this reality of Christ in you and you in Christ and the cross and all these things. And it's, it's bringing that, but you haven't, you haven't had, you know, you haven't had the window open, much less the door. And all that's coming up next here in just a moment. So, um, and Jesus said, you know, blessed are those who have not seen but yet believed. There's a place where you don't see it all, but you start getting stable because you start believing in it. Okay? You gotta, there's got to be faith first. You know, a lot of times Paul says stuff like, knowing this, that your old man is crucified, knowing this, that Christ being raised from the dead died no more, and therefore we're in him, and there's no more death, and all that kind of stuff. Um, knowing is a whole other phase. Faith is first. You've got to believe the truth. You've got to buy the truth, if you understand what I mean. You, meaning, you embrace it. You say, this is the truth. Even, you know, I remember first time I ever heard the truth. Now, I was saved for a little while before that. But, I mean, really heard the truth as it is in Jesus. I heard it, and I couldn't explain one iota what I just heard. But my spirit was going, that's it, that's it, that's it. You know, but as far as my head, I was going, what was that? I mean, I, it, it didn't, because I'd already started sticking stuff in there that wasn't Christ revealed. You know, all this stuff. And so, you know, you're going, oh, man. Well, I, but your spirit is bearing witness because a faith is rising. And I tell you what, it's that faith that rose in my heart well before I knew anything that drove me to knowing. It's that faith that starts counting things lost for something. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Folks, you've got to have that kind of faith at work before you start counting things lost. And, go, you know, if, you're, if something higher than your mind, something higher than your emotion, and I just described uh, the charismatic church and the Bible church or, or Baptist or whatever, you know, or one is, the, it's the emotion of, what you feel or, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the other one is all this cerebral stuff. But when your spirit begins to bear witness with the tr Holy Spirit that this is the Son that's crying, Abba, Father, and you're sensing a greater relationship, it begins to guide over the soul, the mind, the will, the emotion. Your spirit begins to connect in to that oneness and says, this is it, and you begin to pursue, and that's when you start making decisions of counting all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. If, if you already got the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, your Lord, you don't need to count it lost because you got it. But he said, before he got that excellency of knowledge, I'm counting all this lost that I may Know the Lord, that I may know him in the power of it. This is all a working of life in the inner man, a working of life in the inner being of, of who you are, not what you know. You know. And, you know, you've, you've experienced that on some level. Even, even as a new Christian, somebody comes up to you and says, you believe in all that Jesus stuff? That ain't true. And you don't know enough to refute what they're saying. But you're going, hey, you know, I can't explain it. I can't tell you, but I'm telling you Jesus is true. Well, that's the beginning. But that same sort of thing starts happening in you with the revelation of Christ, whereas you go, you know what, this is, this is a fact. I need the Lord in this way, and no one can take that away from me. I'm going after Jesus. All right, so uh, I wrote, it is faith, but not yet revelation. It is faith, but not yet revelation. 
the door of faith will open up the revelation of the new creation. That door will open up the unveiling of the new creation. Does that just practically make sense? And that's why in Galatians he talked a lot about the door of faith for Christians, folks. That was for Christians. That door of faith is that there's another faith that is yet to be revealed. <clears throat> All right. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about this door and window uh, in verse 5 and 6. We read 5, but let's read it again. Or No, we didn't. We read 4. And the waters decreased continually until the tenth month and the seventh month on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountains seen. Okay? And it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark that he had made. All right. And then the next verses right after this are going to get into uh, sending forth the, the raven and the dove. Um, you go through that process and then you get down to verse 15 and 16 and the door is opened for them to leave the ark. But if you'll notice, there's some things that happen here through the window. The, uh, what did it say? The mountains, uh, the tops of the mountains began to be known. Well, there's stability in mountains, amen, especially mountains in the new creation. You, I don't think that window in the ark was like this big bay window, you know, that was like, you went, oh, I think it was this small little opening that you got a glimpse of the truth, of the real deal, the new creation as God sees it. But, and, but just glimpsing it is not going to be enough. Even though you're seeing, you know, everything you've been going through this whole time has been instability and faltering and everything, now you're seeing the tops of the mountains. That's a big step, but it is not a big enough step. Amen? All right. From the scriptures, we notice that the ark found rest, but it was all still unreal to those locked in the ark, meaning once you find rest, if you haven't looked through the window yet, somebody can tell you all about, you know, the new creation, right? It's, it's so clean. It's so pretty. It's so gorgeous. Everything is fresh. And you're, you're sitting there knee-deep in poop in the bottom of that ark. You know, you're, you're kind of going, okay, dude, you just like to really exaggerate, don't you? Because that's what it feels like. I mean, it feels, you know, and or, or you go, you know, you're so spiritual, you're no earthly good. You're floating around in the ether ways, and I'm telling you, when you get down to real nitty-gritty in this ark, and you wake up to reality, it is just hard work, you know? But, but this revelation of the new creation has nothing to do with all that went on in that ark other than it's that ark settled something so that you'd be ready for God's reality to be your reality in a practical way. So it's all unreal until the wind is open and then it's still unreal as far as your walk until the door is open. Amen? So being in the new creation is not enough, meaning here's the, here's the new creation. There is no more flood. There is no, everything now is new creation. But you're in the ark that's in the new creation. So you can say you're in Christ. You're in the new creation. But as far as you're concerned, you're still in the ark that's in the new creation. And you haven't discovered it for yourself. You know, you could say the ark's out there going, "Woo, this is nice, you know. <laughs> you know, if the ark could look around and go, wow, look at all the green, look at all the beautiful stuff, everything looks great, you know. And everybody on the inside's going, tell me more, tell me more, you know. <clears throat> so being, they are in the new creation at that moment, they're just in the ark. 
So let me say that again. So being in the new creation is not enough until you're in, in it, not just in there, but it's yet undiscovered to you. <clears throat> First it requires seeing, then it requires walking. Right? Revelation before your walk. If God hadn't revealed it, quit trying to walk it. It's just a fact. Um, so for this to happen, for seeing to happen, for walking to happen, there has to be a window for seeing, and there has to be a door for walking. Okay? The window was for Noah. The window was for Noah. Uh, he opened the window, and he saw only a portion of the whole new creation. Faith opens the window to see what is stable, the mountains. But then the door is open so we can walk in it. Now remember, it's through that door that Noah sent spies to spy the land out. Raven, dove, remember that? Go check it out, you know, uh, let me find my word. Uh, through it he sent spies, messengers to spy out the land to bring back word of it or fruit of it, just as Moses did. Remember, when they got to the edge of the promised land, which represents the new creation, the wilderness represents the ark, Egypt represents the flood. Anybody remember that? There's this progression that's taken place, and when you get to the edge of the land, you send out spies to bring back fruit of it, to bring back proof of it, to bring back a reality that you may see, that you may comprehend that there might be a beginning of a new reality in your head, especially after a year in that ark. Man, you're ready for old things to pass away. And you're ready to enter into the fullness of that new. So, so as I said, re revelation is first, and then new creation. I wrote an article on that a long time ago, but anyway. The window was also for communication with the new world and for heavenly light. Because it was dark in that ark. Even if they had lanterns. Anybody ever, you know, been in a dark place with no natural light and you got lanterns? Well, you can sort of see, but it's, it's nothing light. Even if that window is just a little square like this. Just... You know, you open that baby and the new creation there and there's no clouds and there's no thunder and there's no, and it's just like pure light and you're just going, ah! Boy, these beasts really are ugly. No, 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 no. <clears throat> no, the, the truth is the light and the window is not for examining what's inside the ark, but for examining what's outside the ark. Um, so the window is for communication with the new world and for heavenly light. The light of the new creation shines in because the clouds, the veil, that hide the sun is now gone. You see, the clouds were like a veil, and the sun was like the S-O-N. The S-U-N was like the S-O-N. And with that, those clouds being rent, with the judgment being gone, now the sun is shining into that dark place where they're at. The light not only gives welcome relief from the, ark, from the dark struggle in the ark, but works with the wind to dry up the judgment and to reveal the new creation. Because at the same time, all this judgment's being dried up, at the same time God's revealing this brand new world that they've, they've entered into. <clears throat> you may have heard the saying that when God shuts the door, he opens a window. Anybody ever heard that saying? I've always hated that saying. <laughs> It's, it's not in the word, but I, anyway, I, it's always, you know, and I, right or I mean, I could be a devil for saying that. I don't know. I, I just know. I'm just telling you my, I've always gone, what? You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like, like, the, like the, yeah, coming into the, the sheepfold another way. Wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say? Anyway. <clears throat> um, well, what, what I wrote was, uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, you may have heard the saying that when God shuts the door, he opens a window, but he does not do so for escape. 
but to see. He opens a window so you can see if that, there's any truth to that statement. It's not so you can get out and run. I'm free. I'm escaping from the insane asylum in there. No, it's so that you can see what's out there. Okay? And that, that's, the, that's the purpose of the window. It's strictly for seeing. It's not for going out there yet. That's, you're jumping the gun. Okay? Before you can walk in the new, you must first see the new. You've got to see it before you can walk in it. All right. However, God did not simply want us to see things and have great revelation and deep knowledge. If that were the case, then he would have only created a window. I just want to get a response on that one. There's so much teaching. There's so much emphasis by, on some you know, parts and some places and some people on deep knowledge and knowing deep things and all this kind of stuff. And if that were the case, then God would have fulfilled it in type and shadow by only, he, he would probably put windows all over the thing. You know, no door. Just, oh, you wouldn't believe what I saw, what I'm seeing over here. Well, look what I'm seeing over here. Oh, that's so deep. But man, look up here. When you go up here, you see even more. Oh, we're all so deep. We're all so spiritual. We're all so stuck in the ark. You know? And here's why I'm saying that. I want Christ to become life. I want this to be more than talk. I want it to be more than, you know, deep spiritual stuff. I've been in too many trials that the deep spiritual stuff didn't help me. I need Jesus, and I need the real Jesus. And nothing else will do. Nothing else really will do. It won't work. So that's why, you know, I, I saw that and I went, you know, you know, he put one window in there and one big door. You know. Of course, we would have people scampering to get up there to the window so we could tell everybody in the dark, you know, Neanderthal regions what we've seen and how spiritual how much light we have compared to you dark creatures anybody know what i'm talking about I just don't want to go there I, I here's why i want to know jesus i really do i don't want to know stuff i don't want to impress you know i don't know that i'm impressing anybody anymore but i want to know jesus and if i don't know jesus i you know what there's a emptiness inside of you even though you know stuff but when you're knowing him he fulfills because he feels full <clears throat> and that stuff doesn't feel full or fulfill <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> but there was a door God managed the door Noah had no control over the door. I assume he had some control over that window because he went back and forth several times, you know. But he, he had no say in when that door came open. <laughs> and that's good and bad. It's bad and good, I would say. <clears throat> um, he opens it and he shuts it. He leads in and he leads out. Because, remember, he let him in. The door was for coming in from judgment and for going out into the greater plan of God. You're blessed coming in. And would you ever believe more blessed coming out? I mean, you're, you think, man, I'm blessed coming in this ark. I'm so glad to miss out on all of that. After a year inside that ark, Man, you're blessed coming out. You are just ready to get out. I, I tell you what, I think I'd rather die than the flood. <laughs> <clears throat> and so he did not just call Israel out of Egypt, but into the promised land. <clears throat> that's the door. The door out of Egypt. It's not all, that's not the end of the program. The door into the promised land. Good. 
I did. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know. Amen. <clears throat> well, because you can, you can feed somebody cotton candy all day, and they'll never really be satisfied or full. <clears throat> they'll go, "Oh, I like this." You know, I've actually served up the cross before and someone said I don't really like that could you you know could you feed us something you know real tasty let's see taste and see that the Lord is good that's not good enough <laughs> alright you ready to talk about uh, the raven and the dove how much time we got oh baby that's great because I really want to cover some ground I've got some I've got some distance to make. Okay, verse 7. They sent forth a raven which went to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth. <clears throat> and he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot. And she re returned unto him into the ark. Notice it didn't say that the raven returned. Um, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. Then he put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto him, into the ark. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So no one knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. And he stayed yet another seven days and sent forth a dove, which returned not again unto him anymore. <clears throat> All right. I get into this a lot in this, in this book uh, that I've written about the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> so I don't want to get into this too much because, I mean, I have things to share that I don't, didn't share in the book. <clears throat> but you notice, first he sent forth the raven. The raven didn't return. Then he sent forth the dove. The dove came back. He sent forth the dove three times. Sent forth the dove. The dove came back, found no rest. Sent forth the dove the second time. He came back with a fig leaf. Is that what it says? Olive, Olive thank God. <clears throat> I thought, wait a minute. Olive leaf in its mouth. And then the third time, sent the dove, and the dove didn't return. Okay? So you have to consider that. All right, the raven, we, we discovered that in the early part of the conference when I was sharing, is an, the, is an unclean bird. So I wrote, the unclean or impure motive is sent forth first. The raven will feed on dead flesh. This is like a fleshly apprehension of what just happened. We will glory in their destruction, in the destruction of all 
flesh in general, but not have it affect us. I, I know what I'm talking about. You can glory in the cross as it means, as it affects, you know, all flesh is death. But somehow it doesn't affect your flesh, where your flesh is dead. You're just glorying more, more or less in a concept, in a theory, yeah. And not glorying in, man, thank God I'm dead, or thank God my beasts are dead. You understand I'm trying to draw the picture by that. <clears throat> so um, we will glory in their destruction for how they mocked or did not help us build the ark. Anybody experience that? <laughs> I'm glad they're dead, man. They, they wouldn't help me do what, I, what God called me to do. <clears throat> the raven focuses on death and is drawn to it. He's an unclean bird. He focuses on it. It's where, where his attention is drawn. <clears throat> It is not all about death and denying yourself, but about the freedom Christ's life brings in us. Now, it does include death. It does include denying yourself. But ultimately, that's not the goal. Christ as our life is the goal. And so... Um, I wrote, we are not giving up or denying earthly dreams, for that phase is gone. Meaning, imagine Noah sitting there before God, you know, told him to build an ark. Oh, I hope to build a big building where people will come gather and I will share and everybody will love the word and, you know, God will do great things and, you know, or, you know, any number of things. They can even be personal things. Oh, that I could have this and that and whatever. We've got all these personal dreams and stuff. Folks, the flood took care of all that. Okay, Once you're in that ark, that ain't going to happen. Those, those issues are gone from you. It's not a struggle anymore. You know that it's gone. So we're not talking about that aspect of it. We are not giving up or denying earthly dreams, for that phase is gone. Our earthly hopes are buried underneath the floods. <clears throat> so we're really talking about, in a sense, flesh and spirit. One goes out and does not return. That's the raven. <clears throat> At the first, sent right out. The raven did not wait on God and missed the timing. It is an unclean bird. To him, the ark was a prison to our raven soul. You ever wondered why you sometimes seem like you're a raven maniac? <laughs> our raven soul finds the ark as a prison, folks. And all, and if, you, and if that's what you're, if you're a raven in there, all you want to do is get out. Huh? That's that na the nature of the thing. Um, it would find no rest for its foot, but its preference was to fly free until it dies instead of returning to the dungeon of death. What does that mean? What did I just say? All I want to do is get out of here. All I want to do is get away from here. What if you die out there? What if you get separated from the Lord or you, you, you get into such a state that you never had the Lord like you did here? I don't care. I'm a raven. I just got to get out of here. Well, what if the floods aren't abated? You're going to be stuck out there with no place to rest. I don't care. I don't care. The timing is coming soon. I don't care. It won't be that much longer. The worst part is over. I don't care. Does that make it a little more clear about what I'm talking about here? <laughs> so, um, Noah sent the soul first because the soul wants answers first. <laughs> That unclean bird, man. You got to help me. I got to know. Are we getting close? Is this thing about over 
<laughs> you know, it's, it's right there at the door going, send me, send me. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I'll come back with some answers. <laughs> so, uh, Noah sent the soul first because the soul wants answers first. When it gets none, then we re will revert to the spirit. Sometimes the, the Lord doesn't answer your soul. Hello? Sometimes he doesn't give you the answer you want because the answer you want is to consume it upon your lust. You know, it is to answer your soul. It's to, it's to find comfort in something other than the Lord. Why would he give you answers to that when his answer is Christ? Doesn't even make sense. But if we don't know that, so... But when, when that raven doesn't return, then we begin to revert to the spirit. A clean spirit is sent. Two different kinds of spies went out from Israel, just like the raven and the dove. One kind brought back an evil report, but the other one a good report. Exact same thing that happened to the raven. I'm sure if he had lived, he'd have said, this is a bad place out here, you know. So it's bad in the ark bad out there you know it's bad you know i haven't told that story in a long long time an old couple sitting in out in the this little town way outside of a big city way out there sitting on their front porch enjoying the sunset and everything and this car pulls up and, and there's a neighbor sitting there sitting there talking to these people on the front porch this car pulls up and said i've been working in the city man and life there is driving me crazy what kind of town is this? Is this, a, is this a good town or a bad town? What, what kind of place is this little town? He said, well, what kind of place was uh, the big city where you came from? He said, oh, it's bad. Everything was bad. Everything was bad. And he said, well, this, you wouldn't like this town. Everything's bad here. So a little while later, another person leaving the city wanting to move out. Hey, what kind of town is this? I wanna, I'm thinking about moving here and everything. He said, well, what kind of place did you move from? He moved from the same city, by the way. He said, it's a good place. Had lots of good neighbors and friends and stuff like that. And he said, you're going to love this town. <laughs> and the guy standing there goes, how come you told one guy it's a bad place and the other one good? He said, whatever your view is, that's what you're going to carry with you. And that's how you're going to view the place that you're at. <clears throat> All right. Um, so when... Um, we let the raven go. We let it go, not to come back to us again. When you let that raven go, you let it go. Go on. Go from me. I don't want your advice anymore. I don't want you as a counselor to me. I want the Lord. And now, after that, we only want to have dove thoughts. But the dove will feed, not on death, but only upon the new creation. The dove descended on Christ, not on what was not Christ. Because the raven, he might, if, there were, if the waters were abated and there were dead bodies around, he'd go straight to the dead bodies and start picking at their dead flesh. Right? You're not going to see a dove over there picking at that dead flesh. He's going to get some fresh olive branches some you know stuff like that that he can eat something that is alive and not something that's dead and that's why I said when the dove descended on Christ it descended on him and not on what was not Christ and I'm I'm saying that because one of the hardest things you will face as a son of God as the bride of Christ as one who knows the Lord is to continue after many, many, many years and not eventually to get off of Christ as the sinner and to get on some other thing that's not Christ and make it the issue. I, I know this because I started in this thing in my early 20s. I've watched my, all my leaders... Watch people get off, and they just, you know, well, this isn't Christ. And then you start preaching what's not Christ instead of Christ. That's not the dove. It's probably the raven. 
because it's picking at something that's actually dead, and, it's, and if it's not dead, it's a dead issue. Christ is where the dove lands. And you stay emphasizing Jesus. And, that, and, and to stay there, to stay right in the center, to stay balanced, that's going to be the, the task. Because it's, after a while, if you're not just regularly seeing Jesus, it's easy to sort of drift over here and, you know, you start getting upset with this or, well, they don't believe this. And, you know, then you start putting down what's blocking them. But really what's blocking them from seeing Jesus isn't that. What's blocking them is they're not being presented Christ. The Holy Spirit will land on Christ if you just give them Christ. I mean, and so good men, God men, I've watched them. And after a certain amount of time, you just start slightly getting off. And, you know, it's the old picture of a, of a bow and arrow. You know, if you've got the target way down there and you're out here and you're looking at it, and if you look, you're just slightly off from the target right here. You know, just slightly off. But when you let it go, if you're slightly off here, the target's here and that thing will just get, you know. It'll be further off than it looked. You'll just get further off and further off. You got to keep your heart after Jesus. That's got to be the important thing to you. Jesus, nothing else. You can mention things at times, but always with the point of bringing people back to Jesus. How much time did you say we got? Nine minutes. Well, I am so thankful. All right. Um, <clears throat> the feeding of the dove is upon Christ and what is new and not on what happened to the old. A lot of times we're trying to get the Lord to deal with us about what happened to the old. <laughs> you know, hey, Holy Spirit, and this black, unclean bird shows up. You know that? Oh, you look different than I thought you would, Holy Spirit. You know? <clears throat> so, we must let the old, capital old, we must let the old creation, the old and thoughts of it go from us and not come back again. Do we look at the dead things of this world and fret or at the realities of the new creation? I think, we, I think we've got a better chance if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus. <laughs> That's my thought. All right, when the ark is in a position of rest, then the dove is sent forth. Remember? That's the order. The, the ark found rest, then the dove is sent forth. The eyes are turned from the beast within to the things that are above. That window opens up. And now you're thinking about what's out there, not what's in here. You've spent a whole year fighting with them beasts. You are ready to get your eyes on Jesus. You are ready to see something new of him and to partake of something fresh from him. <clears throat> so um, once you are in the new creation, the view of things is not based upon the old. Once you step out that door, the view is no longer about the old. There is no wrestling with the old. It is past. Christ is the emphasis, and you as one with him in resurrection. That's where your emphasis is. Because that's where you are now. That's where you are now. You are raised up with him. The dove knows the earth is still under the waters of judgment and returns. Talking about the first trip out of the dove. The dove knows the earth is still under the waters of judgment and returns because he has no part with it. It might be rough in that ark, but it's better than the judgment going on out there. However, the second time the dove returns with fruit, he brings us hope because there's evidence. It's more than talk. It's more than seeing some light practical evidence of a reality that God lives in every day. 
it begins to open you up in a whole new realm. This dove is, uh, and this is what I got into in, in the book. <clears throat> the dove displays living proof of Christ and not just doctrines to hold on to while you're in the dark. I kind of like that statement. <laughs> I thought that's, you know, the way it's presented sometimes, it almost feels like we're being presented with doctrines to hold on while we sit in the dark. I don't want to do that. You know, and the dove, man, he's, he's giving you proof of Christ. Living proof. That branch, those, that olive, those were living. The dove's leaf or the fruit, well, I'll just say the, let me skip that. First, Noah sees through the eyes of the dove by what the dove brought him, the fruit, right? He's, see, he's basically seeing through the eyes of the dove but when the door is open, he sees it for himself. And then the third time, the dove is free in the new creation. You're free. You're free. All right. Time is marking down. So we're going to go ahead and stop here. This is a good stopping place. And we will.